All right, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. So what we can do is, as they are coming in, we can start off. By the way, but I will just take any questions and then I will uh, start off where I left off in the intro to Islam. So go ahead. I think you were asking some questions when I walked in here. Uh, so any question based upon what you observed in there, what the sermon was, and anything regarding the prayer? Yes. Um, do the children usually go up with the women, or were, were there some down with the men? Okay, so the question is, what about the children? Do they go up with the women or do they stay down? It depends on the age, by the way. You know, like a 12, 13 year old boy, they would be preferred to be with the dads and with the men. If they are like younger, like my, um, what do you call, my first grader, he usually prays with uh, my wife. Okay. Yes, so it just depends on the age, yeah. Okay, question? Um, there were some questions, um, they were asking why does everybody have to pray shoulder to shoulder, Okay, that sounds good and um, those are all good questions. So the very first question was about uh, the prayer itself, the way that we pray. So really important, the way that we Muslims pray is the way we are following how the Prophet used to pray. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And he was taught by God himself through Angel Gabriel. So Angel Gabriel came in the form of a human, a man, and he taught Muhammad, peace be upon him, how to pray when to pray, the actions, the motions, the recitation, and also the way that we pray in the group prayer. So all of those have been taught. So we are just following what he used to pray, right? But just a footnote, the way that we are praying, as I mentioned uh, before the lunchtime, is that all the prophets, they used to pray the same way. And I'll just give you maybe two or three examples from the Bible itself. So it says in the book of Genesis chapter 17 verse number 3 when the time for prayer came Abraham he went to a secluded place over there he prayed directly to one God and he was pr prostrating himself on the ground exactly with the way that you have seen Muslims pray. The reason we are following that is because we also follow Abraham peace be upon him his rituals his actions his prayers and especially his belief in the absolute oneness of God. It speaks about in the book of Numbers that Moses and his brother Aaron and their family, when they went to the place of worship, they prayed exactly the same way as you see us pray. So when it came to Jesus, who we consider and we follow him and we say that he's a mighty prophet, you know, he went one day to the garden of Gethsemane. So this is before the people were coming after him. So he escaped them. He went to a secluded place called the garden of Gethsemane. Over there, he pl placed his forehead on the ground and he was praying to God, saying that, Oh God, take this cup of death away from me. Not my will, but your will. And this is present in the New Testament, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26, verse number 39. You singing in our services. And okay. Uh, so in prayers that we do, or in the, in the call for prayer also, it may appear as if it's singing, but we don't say it is singing, by the way. We are just beautifying our voice just to uh, recite those passages of the Quran and also the call for prayer. So we don't have hymns in our service. We have uh, the quotations or the passages from the Quran and the praises of God. So just recall it from the memory. You know, unlike in a Christian church, you may have uh, some books, some pages or something in front of you that you look at it and you read from it or you sing from it. So. Every Muslim, we are supposed to memorize certain passages from the Quran. Uh, so you'll be amazed to find out that the whole Quran has been passed down from the time of Muhammad, peace be upon him, up until our time in memory of humans. So he memorized the whole Quran, by the way, means Muhammad, peace be upon him. His followers <coughs> memorized it. And it's not a small book, it's like a big book, like hundreds of pages, 6,000 plus passages in there. And that memorization process is coming down from that time to our time and amazingly there are 10 million plus memorizers of the whole Quran right now in the whole world. So even my first grader by the way he memorized close to 20 chapters of the Quran in Arabic language. He can stand up over here and he can start reciting and I can hold the book over here just to see if he's making any mistakes or pretending. No he memorized the whole I mean the, the 20 chapters by the way right. So in that way the Quran, so there is a prophecy in the Quran that it is going to be protected. God made the prophecy, chapter 15 verse number 9, that
that it is God's message and he is going to protect it. And we say this is a miracle, this is the way it is protected. So how about the question of the converts? So Islam is a faith in which anyone of their own choice, they can convert to Islam. So it's really important, the Quran says there is no force in conversion by the way. If anyone is forcing anybody, that's not conversion. So this is mentioned in chapter 2 verse number 256. It says that there is no compulsion in faith, a person has the choice. So in this mosque, almost every week, every month, there are many conversions. People, they call over here and they say, you know what, I have been reading about Islam. I have a few questions. Can, we, can I come and sit down with the Imam, with the scholar? And we have them come over here. We have small sessions like these. And after the sessions of their own choice, majority of them, they say, you know what, the oneness of God resonates with us. The comprehensive guidance of the Quran resonates with us. Uh, the concept of modesty of women resonates with us. Now we want to convert. So about 24% of the Muslims in the USA, they are converts to Islam. And in the USA, Islam is the fastest growing faith, according to CNN and Fox and uh, Chicago Tribune and different media outlets. It is the fastest growing faith, which is paradoxical by the way, right? Based upon the number of misconceptions people have, even then, people are converting after they know what Islam is. Even more amazing is that 60% to 40% females to males ratio when it comes to conversion by the way. So really briefly about Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. So he was born in the city of Mecca in the year 570. So when he was born as he was growing up he was just an ordinary person. Until the age of 40 that's when angel Gabriel was sent by God. And that's when he was appointed as a prophet. But before that time, he was still an amazing person, by the way. He was given the title of the most honest and the most truthful person. In Arabic, it is a sadiq and al amin. So all of Arabia used to recognize him and he had the credibility that the best person, the most credible, the most authentic, never lied, never cheated, uphold the promises. You know, like nowadays when the youth, when they have to introduce each other, they may say, you know, I like basketball or I play video games, I'm good in Fortnite and whatnot, right? <laughs> in those days when they used to introduce him, they used to say, he is the most honest amongst us and he's the most truthful amongst us. So at, at the age of 40, God started to reveal passages of the Quran to him. So the whole Quran was revealed by God, it took about 23 years. So God could have given the whole Quran in one piece, but he wanted the Muslims and the Prophet to know the Quran, those passages, or to process them and to practice them and to share with them. So it just becomes more manageable. So from the time of 610 CE all the way to 633 CE until he passed away, the passages of the Quran they came. Sometimes uh, chapters used to come, sometimes some verses used to come. So he memorized the whole thing, he helped his uh, followers memorize it and they wrote it down in his lifetime by the way, in different bits and pieces. And so from that time up until our time, both in the memory and in the writing, the Quran has been passed down to us. So regarding the birthdays, uh, just from the Islamic theological point of view, we are not supposed to celebrate the birthday of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him or Jesus peace be upon him or any Prophet, not, our, not even our own birthdays by the way, just from the religious point of view. But as Muslims are living here, there is a cultural influx and whatnot. Some Muslims, because of culture, they may celebrate birthdays. You know, Chuck E. Cheese and whatnot, right? <laughs> People go there, and uh, which is often you see it. So, uh, yeah, just from the cultural point of view, we don't. But you may see in the media, you may see in India, Pakistan, Malaysia, some Muslims are doing it because, uh, you know, not every person practices Islam, its fundamentals. There's many things uh, that also has to do with the cultural influence based upon where you live. So that's important for us to have a demarcation between the cultural practices from the pure teachings of Islam. Yes. So if you could talk about the two holidays that we do recognize, the two Eids, I talk a little yes. bit about that too. Sure, sure. So again, just as a follow-up on the celebrations, Muslims do celebrate two important days. So the very first day, comes right after the 30, 29 to 30 days of fasting. So the very next day after the month of fasting is uh, a day of celebration. 
just to recognize the wonderful blessings that God has given to us in the form of the food and the health and the family and for all of humanity. So that's one celebration. The second celebration is we have also aligns with our Jewish and the Christian friends that has to do with the person of Abraham, peace be upon him. So the story of Abraham and his sacrificial son is also mentioned in the Quran, by the way. So that, that day in which that happened, Muslims also recognize it and we celebrate it. And we also remember that how we should also sacrifice for God and for humanity uh, to make humanity, you know, better humanity. So By a shark. Oh, okay. <laughs> how would people be resurrected when they would be eaten by shark? Uh, so, there is, so a quick simple answer would be, if God could create the whole universe from nothing, He can create you or all of us from nothing, even though we are eaten by shark or burned or drowned in the sea or cremated. If God could do that big of a creation, bringing us from nothing or from something, would be nothing in front of God. Good, smart question, by the way. Okay, who knows the five pillars, by the way, the five good actions? Anybody? Yes, to, uh, to testify verbally, believing in our heart and then testifying that I bear witness, no other God besides one God, Allah. And I bear witness, Muhammad is his messenger. So that's the very first and the most important pillar of Islam. So when a person converts to Islam, we don't have baptism, we don't have dipping in the pool. There's no basement here, by the way. Oh, there is, <laughs> but no, but we don't have baptism. A person has to recite the testimony of faith, understanding Islam and then reciting the testimony of faith to formally convert to Islam. Okay, so we have four more pillars to go, by the way. Take a guess. Yes, sir. So. Let them know what is Hajj. It's a strange word for them. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a type of pilgrimage to Mecca. There we go. Oh, it is a pilgrimage, actually. So once in a lifetime, you guys knew that, right? Yeah. Okay. So raise your hand next time. So once in a lifetime, once in a lifetime, a Muslim is obligated to go to Mecca for the pilgrimage. So again, as I mentioned, in Mecca is the first and the oldest house to worship one God. Built by two prophets, I mentioned, right? Who were the two prophets? Abraham, Abraham and his oldest son? Ishmael. Yes. So I went for my Hajj, for my pilgrimage, like maybe six years ago. Amazing experience, by the way. Just imagine all of Chicago, three million people coming together, not speaking the same language, different races and cultures and nationalities, all of us coming together. But when the time for prayer comes, everyone knows how to pray together. There is no translator up there, by the way. Once the call for prayer comes in, everyone stands shoulder to shoulder and we pray exactly the same way, the way that you guys see us over here. So that's the second pillar. Three more to go. Yes? Is prayer one? Yes, prayer. So praying five times a day is, uh, all, so let's say that's the third pillar. Right? So you have seen the second prayer of the day, by the way, right? Uh, two more to go. Wonderful, yes. So, we are supposed to share 2.5% at least of our, share, of our saved assets. Like a, an offering, and then there's the, what's different between the general offering and the zakat? Okay, so there are two different ways of donation, right? One is an obligatory donation. So this 2.5% of the saved assets, this is the obligatory donation. No, be, beyond the obligatory, a person can donate, you know, any amount. So I think we have, uh, what, two more to go? No, just one more pillar to go, yes. Is it fasting? One the yes. So fasting in the month of Ramadan is, uh, what, the fifth one, right? Yes. So these are not the only good actions a Muslim is supposed to do. There are other good actions. It is an obligation for every Muslim to gain knowledge. And gaining of knowledge does not st uh, stop when you are sophomore, then you can drop out, right? No, gaining of knowledge is continuous until you pass away, until you are in the grave. So from cradle to grave, it's gaining of knowledge. You know, by gaining of knowledge, uh, that's when I can realize, maybe you can realize the wonderful uh, majesty of God, the almighty nature of God. A Muslim is supposed to be indulging in the society, as the Imam mentioned, you guys caught it or not, I'm not sure. 
He mentioned that a Muslim is supposed to be a part of the bigger society to make the society better. You know, Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was the peacemaker in the society. He was the ambassador, a positive force in the society. And every Muslim is supposed to, you know, emulate that. And we are supposed to also indulge in the bigger society. So there are many passages in the Quran that speaks about that how we should enjoin good and forbid evil. If there is some goodness in the society, we should multiply the goodness by joining it. If there is any harm or wrong in the society, we work with the good-hearted people to eradicate the wrong. And last but not the least, there are certain responsibilities that God has given to a Muslim. A responsibility that we have towards God, knowing him, worshipping him, following his guidance. We have responsibility towards Muhammad, peace be upon him, knowing him, loving him, following him, and to all the prophets. Then a big responsibility Muslims have towards our parents. The Quran is big on it. Muhammad, peace be upon him, is big on it. One time a person came to the Prophet and asked him this question that of all the people in the world, who should be my love, my kindness, my compassion, my allegiance should go towards? The Prophet said, your mother. And then the person asked, okay, fine, then who next? And the Prophet said, your mother. The third time the Prophet said, your mother. The fourth time the Prophet said, your father. Right? Dads. <laughs> So if um, moms and dad, if we are playing uh, spiritual Olympics, the gold, the silver and the bronze medal goes to the moms, right? <laughs> and the poor dads, we come home with the you know, participation prize, <laughs> correct? <laughs> Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said, that paradise lies beneath the feet of your mothers, means by obeying, taking care of them, respecting them. That is one of the ways to go to paradise. So in Islam, there is no real concept of a nursing home. The nursing home of the parents is the home of the child. So that's how big Islam is about parents. Then we have certain responsibilities towards our neighbors. You know, one of the sayings of Muhammad, peace be upon him, is that you are not a full believer if you eat your full and if your neighbors are hungry. So in that way, Islam has a set of belief system and a set of deed system that covers all the aspect of life of a person, a family, and yes, humanity. So in a nutshell, that's what Islam is. Right? So let's take your question, well, their question, right, about the hijab. So it's really important when it comes to the hijab. Hijab means uh, the covering, right? The covering of modesty. As our sister is wearing, the sister in the back, the sister in the back, as you're wearing. It's important that Hijab, so that's called hijab by the way. Hijab is a dress code. You know, anywhere that you go, there is a dress code. In the hospital, there's a dress code. Uh, my children, when they go to school, there is a dress code. In certain times or certain days, they're supposed to wear like colored socks. Certain times, you know, white socks. It's annoying sometimes, by the way. <laughs> they have to pick and choose in the morning time. But that's the dress code. If you go to a restaurant, it is... You know, no shirt, no uh, shoes, no service, correct? So this is the dress code of modesty that God has given to humanity, important. So it is mentioned in the Quran two different times, two different places about the commandment of wearing uh, modesty. But modesty is not only for the ladies, by the way, it's really important. Modesty is also for the males, for the guys. So as a male, I cannot wear transparent or tight clothes. As a male, I cannot wear clothes of the opposite gender or extravagant clothes to waste my money. So the concept of modesty is for both sisters and the brothers. For the sisters more, the brothers a little bit less. Number four thing is, concept of modesty is a holistic concept. It's not just about what we wear. It's about the state of mind. You know, Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said, when he speaks about the tongue, the modesty of the tongue, he said that say something good or remain silent. How many marriages can be saved, <laughs> right? I'm serious, but people get emotional, they say things and then, then they regret. So it's important, modesty of our eyes, we cannot be, uh, you know, looking and staring and lusting after people. Modesty of our ears, modesty of our actions. So it's a holistic concept. It's for both males and for females. 
but some people they may have the misconception that you know people are forced to wear the hijab by the husband by the uh, you know fathers by the sons by the brothers that's not the case any sister who is wearing the hijab she is doing it to please the creator really important even in the jewish faith and the christian faith you guys may know it based upon your background jewish ladies just if you go with the teachings once she gets married she cannot show her hair she has to cover her hair that's part of the jewish uh, teachings even for the christian sisters it says in the first book of corinthians chapter 11 verse number 5 and 6 this is the new testament that especially when the christian ladies when you go to the church it's an obligation for the christian ladies to cover themselves so islam is not the first or the only faith modesty concept is also there in other faiths but last but not the least it's really important the concept of modesty or the covering and the hijab it is not a hurdle for the muslim ladies to let the world know that who they are they want themselves to be recognized by their spirituality by their talents by their personality and not be objectified sometimes you know some cultures objectify people so modesty is a holistic concept for both males and females and we say if the society abides by it a society would be chaste, harmonious and a just society and that is hijab any question on that i know i took a little bit longer time because according to usa today the number one misconception our non-muslim friends have is about women in islam yeah yes to, so for the hijab is there a certain age that like they have to or like for like the girls to start wearing it right. or anything like that or is it just they just start wearing it oh, okay anything anything becomes obligatory for the muslims uh, from the age of puberty even like when we pray five times we encourage our children to pray with us obviously they should get used to it you know my seven year old last year he fasted all the 30 days all right i mean he doesn't have to but he did and we i mean we kind of encourage him to some degree but he wanted by himself but it does not become uh, obligatory until they reach, uh, reach the age of puberty. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, going back to the five, five times that you pray a day, like if you're in school or like, well first, do you have to do that here? Like when you pray five days a day, do you have to come here to pray? Oh, okay. So the question is, uh, how do we manage uh, prayer and the work? or going to school right yeah, work and work. sure a person can literally pray anywhere like suppose if i'm in the hospital working in my lunch break or some break i can take like 10 minutes off i can go to my office some nice clean place i will pray up there okay. suppose so if i'm with... yeah because all of us you know we get some breaks all throughout our day correct even as a student you get break person who is um, you know going to any work gets a break suppose if i'm driving from here to ohio and the time for prayer came in i will just pull over go to the rest area and i will pray up there coming to the mosque and prayer and praying is a 27 times more bonus points more reward but if the person cannot come in they can just pray anywhere they will still get the reward but the bottom line is it's an obligation and they are supposed to be praying what are the what are the times what are the times for the prayer fine so the very first prayer is before sunrise so sunrise nowadays is what 6:25 ish around that time. So before that time, so so these timings are not like exact times. These are like the periods. These are the time slots. So the first prayer it ends by sunset, but it begins about an hour and a half before sunset. So in that time slot, I can wake up, come to the mosque, and pray. The second time slot is uh, early afternoon. The one that you saw today. The third one is late afternoon. The fourth one is right after sunset and the fifth one when it becomes dark. Yeah. Some people may ask, okay, how come you have to pray five times? So the analogy which I give is, you know, we have to eat certain number of times a day to nourish our bodies. So we pray certain number of times a day that God has obligated to nourish our soul. We take break from the stressful life, from the studies, from the work and we connect with God. This is a way to recharge ourselves and for us to realize that there is a God, we have a higher purpose. All the things that we do should align towards pleasing Him and following His guidance. 
Um, would you say there's like punishments or anything if you like miss prayers, or would you just say that's like judgment of God? Yeah. Okay, so what happens if a person misses the prayer? So we are not supposed to be intentionally missing the prayers. So for example, suppose if I like overslept for the morning prayer. When I wake up, I have to now quickly wash myself and I have to pray and I have to also repent to God. So when we, so, so the concept of forgiveness in Islam is this, right? So there are four or five different steps a person needs to do to be forgiven. First and foremost, we need to acknowledge that we have made that mistake. The second thing is, then we need to sincerely repent to God. Thirdly, when we repent to God, there should not be any mediator, not even Muhammad, peace be upon him, directly repenting to God. Number fourthly, we need to make a sincere commitment not to make that mistake again. I mean, human beings, we, you know, we are all the time, but still we have to make that intention. And last but not the least, we have to do some good deeds, like extra good deeds, right? So in this way, the Quran says in chapter number 33 and also in chapter 4 verse number 116 that God is going to forgive and willing to forgive all the sins. So we are hopeful that even when we make mistakes, uh, God can forgive us. That's one of the names of God that He's forgiving and He's a merciful God. So th that is contrasting with the Christian faith in which somebody dies, you know, Jesus Christ died for your sins or not. In Islam, the concept of salvation is that it depends on the, it, it is a personal accountability. So it says in the Quran chapter 2 verse number 25, if a person has the right belief and doing good deeds, then God is going to guarantee the person eternal paradise. So all the prayers and everything are in Arabic, but do uh, Muslims that don't understand Arabic, do they read a different version of the Quran in their language or do they still only read it in Arabic? Okay, so there are two kinds of prayers. One would be the, or the five day, times of worship. So those are in Arabic. But besides the five prayers which are in Arabic, there are other prayers we can do in any language. I mean, I can pray right now in English saying that, Oh God, bring justice and peace to the world. In English, correct? God can understand. Just the five formal prayers are in Arabic. The rest of the prayers can be in any language. I can sit in the car before I start driving. I can pray to God for the safety of myself and the people around me. So for those people who are new to Islam, we have uh, classes in this mosque and many mosques to at least uh, teach them the basics of Islam and the, the initial parts of the Quran that they need to know, they need to memorize, so they can do the prayer. There is only one version of the Quran, Arabic. But we have many translations of the Quran for those people who may not know how to read and write uh, Arabic, they can still get the main message of the Quran in any language. And there are many apps too, you can download those. So there is a passage in the Quran, chapter 49, verse number 13. And this kind of sum, sums up the whole thing that we have done today. So in this passage of the Quran, this is the translation. Uh, God is uh, addressing humanity and this is how he addresses. So God says that, O humanity, O mankind, I have created you from one single male and one single female and made you into nations and peoples and tribes that you get to know each other. Not that you may hate and discriminate and bias with each other, you get to know each other. And then God concludes by saying that the best amongst you is the one who is a pious and well-mannered person. So I hope and pray that all of us as we came together, together here as brothers and sisters in humanity, we can work together on the common platform that we have. So we can, inshallah, God willing, you know, eradicate all the ills and form societies which are based upon justice, morality and peace for all. Thanks a lot for coming.